with Seato Crystal Coast and uh, also with the um, Coastal Carolina Fishermen uh, e-magazine. We wanted to uh, thank you for coming tonight, being here everyone, and uh, joining our uh, webinar, Seato uh, Member Night webinar on the Art of Founder Gigging with our guest speaker, Clint Williams. Clint, welcome. Thanks for uh, uh, taking the time to share your knowledge with us tonight. Uh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we're, you know what, we're looking forward to this because, you know, I've, I've chartered fish before, I've, I've got a pretty good background in fishing, but I've never been flounder gigging, I've always been intrigued with it, and since meeting you, I've gotten even more intrigued with it, and, and that's probably why I uh, made you promise to take me sometime uh, in the near future, but uh, it's, it definitely looks like it's a, uh, a sport that I, I would really like because of the convenience aspect of it. Um, you know, let's start a little bit. Let me ask you a few questions, Clint, to kind of put, put us on the path. You know, the flounder gigging, a lot of people don't really understand, uh, I guess, the benefits of it. And, and, and I knew that it was uh, something interesting, but I really didn't know the benefits. Tell us exactly what the benefits are to flounder gigging versus uh, um, hook and tackle from a boat or, or from the shore or whatever. Tell us what those, uh, those benefits would be. The, the primary benefit is it's a selective gear. It's a selective type of fishing. Um, you, with hook and line or nets or anything else, you, you're pretty much just getting what bites or what gets hung in your nets or, or what gets trapped in them. Um, you know, so you, if you're fishing for flounder, hook and line, sometimes you, know, you catch pinfish, you catch other types of species, um, and you know, sometimes those hooks, can get lodged deep down and, and kill the fish. Same way with the nets, you have a bycatch as well. Um, flounder gigging is selective, selective gear. You can see what you're going after, you know that's what you want, and you're not having any type of byproduct. Okay. Well, that, you that's, know, that's, that's, a... that's the primary. That's, that's the primary uh, focus on, on gigging. You know, some of the secondary ones, you know, it's actually you can get out for a little less money, you can get out there and actually walk around and look for the flounder, look for the fish that you want. And it's not just flounder. You can gig other type of fish as well, too, as long as there's not red drum. Um, and, and you got to stay within your slot size, uh, your, your size limits and all, and that varies from state to state. But you, know, you can get out there and, and catch crabs, blue crabs, stone crabs when they're in season. Um, you know, pretty much it's shrimp. Uh, you, know, you see a lot of different types of shrimp. So, I mean, you can get out there and you actually enjoy it and you can walk around and see things. Or if you're in a boat, you can get out there and ride around in the boat and see different fish, you know, sheep's head, black drum and all, and, and uh, can gig those and take those as well. Well, you know, I, I guess another thing, too, is there's a lot of guys uh, or, or ladies out there that, that maybe they work uh, during the day and, and they have jobs, and the, but they like to do something at night, but traditionally we don't fish at night you know, from a boat. So, <coughs> excuse me, this allows them an option that they can go out, you know, late in the evening and, and still uh, uh, do something to uh, satisfy their fishing habit. And yeah, you, it, so that's a pretty good option. Right, it's, you know, it's, and, and don't limit it just to men. Like you said, women can do it and children can do it as well, too. You know, it, it's a family outing, so it's things that you can do. A lot of times, you know, people come down on vacation to the coast. They're, they're fishing during the day, and then they go back home. And, and even if they're not out shark fishing or something else at night, they go back to the house, and they're just sitting around, and they want something else to do. This is something that can get the kids involved. The kids can get out there and actually start enjoying it, get it, get it in their blood, then they want to start doing it more and more and more, and then they can pass it down to their children. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Now, your company, Fish Sticks, has created a product, which we'll talk about a little later on, but you basically, for the most part, that product's designed a little differently than the way I had always understood flounder gigging, which was from a boat, from the bow of a boat or the side of a boat, um, going up in the shallows and in the flats and, and, and looking for the flounder. And therefore gigging them. But now you've got something, and it's becoming more and more popular, I understand, which is actually walking and, and gigging from walking and basically stalking the flounder, looking for them. And I was interested when you and I talked, you talked about how you can, can see where the flounders actually move little by little. Tell us why the flounder moves and, and what their movement habits are. Well, a lot of times what the flounder are doing, they're moving from you know, deeper water to shallow water, and they're, they're primarily chasing after the bait fish. Um, that's, that's their primary goal is to catch fish they've got to eat. So anytime you see any, any type of bait fish, shrimp, uh, 
you know, small crabs, anything of that nature that they tend to eat, that's where the flounder tend to move to. And as the tide comes in, the flounder will move up the, the shoreline, up the beachhead, chasing after those small fish when they're sitting in that two inches of water in that little wash line. And as the tide goes back out, they'll gradually move back out. And they'll move in different spots, you know, around um, high lines, around piers, grass, holes. If they find a, a crab hole or a fish hole that has made an indention in the, in the sand, you know, in the bottom of the water, they'll sit in those holes if it's not occupied. And, and they'll lay there waiting for the bait fish to swim by in the current. And typically they like to sit facing into the current, but I've seen them sitting, you know, every which way. You know, when you start saying they do this specific thing, you're going to find out that it, it, they change it up. Uh, they're not set in stone on the way they specifically do. Well, you know, and, and flounder, from, like I said, from having fished, I, I, one thing I know is, number one, flounder is an incredibly smart, smart fish. Uh, <clears throat> I know hook and line fishing, you, you can count them if you catch them up under a dock. They, they pretty much know how to take your line and wrap it around that dock, uh, that piling three or four times. Yeah. Uh, in order to get it to break off. They, they know those tricks out there. But also a flounder is basically lazy. He's not moving around a whole lot. He's actually waiting on the bait to swim by him. Isn't, isn't that pretty much correct? Yeah, um, I've been out before and actually, and I got some video of one where the flounder was sitting still and two or three crabs were actually walking over top of him. One walked over his tail, one walked over his eyes and his mouth, and that, cra and that flounder just sat there absolutely still. The stiller they are, the, the more chances they have of actually catching bait to swim by. If they start twitching or moving, then the bait fish are going to know that, and they're going to swim away from that area. So they, they tend to think that you don't see them. And, it, and it's unlike, I've had a lot of people use the analogy, it's, you know, gigging is the same thing as, as spotlighting deer. You know, that flounder's not blinded by the light when you're gigging from a boat or, or walking. That flounder doesn't pay any attention to you. It just knows that there's something moving around, and it just starts watching. It'll swim off in a heartbeat, unlike a deer when you blind him, you just stand still. A flounder will take off. But pretty much primarily they sit still. They don't think you see them, and a lot of times you don't see them, and you actually step on them because they're down in the sediment a little bit. Now, uh, with that being said, you know, again, you and I talked previously about this. We did an article uh, about, about flou uh, flounder gigging just recently. Uh, and I, I was really interested to learn about the stalking process and about, you know, once you're out there and, and, and walking or even in a boat, you know, what the fact that, it, I said, what do you look for? You know, what, what exactly do, do you try to find that indicates there's a flounder there? And, you know, here's a guy that's doing the walking process like you do. But I do want to get to this. And, and I, I found this picture after you and I talked, and it was you had – perfectly described exactly what we're looking at. So tell, tell these guys what um, uh, was really uh, really kind of what, what they're going to see out there. I think this kind of, kind of says it all. Yeah, that, that's, that's a perfect picture. I mean, the, a lot of times what you'll see is you'll actually see that imprint. You won't see the fish sitting in the imprint. And, and when he's not in there, it, it looks like what I described to you before as a football with a tail. And, and that's what you want to look for. Um, when you do get walking around and you start seeing some imprints, you want to pay attention to it to see if it's got soft edges. If the edges of it are soft, you know, the, of where the fish has been sitting, then it means it's an older print. If you start walking around and you actually see a print that looks like it's fresh, there's a, it's a sharp edge, if, if there, a fish could be in it, you know, you want to go up and gig it like the fish is there because he may be down under that layer of sediment and you just can't see his eyes. Or it may be that he just moved, and he's moved on up about four or five feet just into the current. Something may have spooked him, or he may have just shifted his position. It's, it's real easy. If you, if you start seeing these imprints, you can track them. And I've done that before. I've tracked a fish for about 45 minutes before I walked up onto him, and it was the exact same fish. He just made, like, footsteps. Um, but you, that's what you want to look for. You, know, you want to see those imprints. You want to start looking. Um, you know, like I said, up around the grassy areas and stuff, they like laying in the grass, uh, anything that gives them camouflage. And they do change color. I've seen them before to where one was in sand, in, in a sandy uh, tan color sand, and then two feet up, there was a kind of a mucky, dark, darkish-looking brackish sand, 
and there was one sitting there, and he was the exact same color as that fan, so they can change your color. Wow. Okay. All right. So now we're out there. We, we, you know, what do we need to prepare for? Let's talk about that for a minute. Whether it be boat, whether it be walking, what do we need if we've never been before? Uh, I mean, to me, it looks pretty simple. But sure as I say that, I'm going to get out there and forget something very, very important. And I, I have to say, I, I, I've looked at your product uh, that you have, and, and there's one thing that you've got on that product that I never would have thought about taking. And you, you know what it probably is, don't you? Oh yeah, yeah the stringer. The stringer. I, I would have, I would have gotten out there. Okay, <laughs> I've, I've gigged the flounder. Now what am I going to do? I'm going to have to keep you right. gigged and walk all the way back to my truck. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Tell us exactly what we have to have, and then some suggestions on what we might want to also consider taking. Well, you know, if, if you're in a boat, you know, you need to make sure when you got gas and you know where you're going. You need to have your good your lights set up, make sure that your light's working, whether they're submersible or the ones on top. Um, if you run in a generator, you need to make sure that you've got extra gas for your generator because uh, you, you don't want to get out there and get going two or three hours and then you run out of gas on the generator. Or your batteries are charged up. Make sure, you know, if you run an LED that your trolling motor battery is fully charged so that way you don't run out and have a spare as well. Um, you want your gig poles to make sure you know that they're good and, good and strong, that your gig heads are, are staying on the end. You know, every so often while you're out gigging, you want to make sure that you reach down and tighten it up if you don't have any type of Loctite or anything else on it because you will lose a gig head if you're not careful when you start pulling. Um, you know, and make sure you know you got extra bulbs if you have the regular lights or, you know, LEDs have a, have a spare in case one goes out. LEDs very rarely go out, but there are some problems and some electric issues can happen. And then you got to have a place to put the flounder. You know, it's in, in the boat, you got to have a flounder box or a cooler with ice on them so that way they don't go bad. Um, if you're out walking, oh, and then also too, either way, you need to make sure that you've got something to eat and some water and stuff. You're out there for long periods of time, you need to make sure that you've got some hydration. And alcohol is not a, a hydration; <laughs> it, it will dehydrate you more. So. You just want to be careful with that. Um, if you're out walking around, you need to make sure that you've got your light, make sure that your light works. you got your extra batteries where whichever type of batteries you use, whether it's a backpack battery system or a rechargeable battery um, you know, pack for your light, a fanny pack. Uh, mine runs off of um, some other types of batteries. You need to make sure you've got those batteries charged up and you've got extra ones. Make sure your gig, you've got your gig, and that it's it's in working order. Same thing. Make sure it's tight, and then you got to have a place to put your your flounder. I provide a stringer. You can take um, any type of stringer that that you know a string, a rope, or anything, and run it through the gills and just pull it behind you, or you can take and throw them on the bank or carry a cooler. That that's just some of the things that you need to think about. Bug spray is a big thing. You need to make sure. Whether you're in a boat or walking, that you've got the bug spray because once the bugs come out, if it, that wind stops blowing, you need to make sure if you've got some, some bug spray to get the bugs off of you. And a secondary flashlight. There's nothing worse than your light going out, something happens, you lose your batteries, or it just dies on you and you in the total darkness and you don't have a secondary flashlight to get you back to the to where you need to go. So you need to make sure that that's the primary things you need. And I would imagine on the walking aspect, too, you'd want to wear some type of shoes. You don't want to be out oh, on oyster beds yeah. or around oysters. That, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I've got a pair of, uh, like, boat shoes that I wear, um, you know, that, that I wear out there. And then, you know, when it starts getting the water gets cooler and colder or when the, um, when the um, jellyfish really start coming in, the ones that have got the tentacles and all that stuff, you want to make sure that you got a thin pair of, of rubber waders on, you know, hip waders or chest waders or something just to kind of give you a little bit more of a barrier when you're out there walking around in November. Uh, that's usually when the jellyfish start coming around. So, And then you, when you're walking around, you know, another thing too, you want to make sure that you shuffle your feet. You don't pick your feet up and walk. You want to shuffle. And that's to make sure that if there's any stingrays or skates, you don't step on them and get stung uh, by the stingrays. So you want to make sure you shuffle your feet because that way if you kick them, most of the time they'll take off and they won't get spooked as bad. Well, you know, that's some great advice I never really thought about. I mean, obviously, uh, you're the expert here, but I, you, th th just the thought of that kind of terrifies me a little bit. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good piece well, of it, advice for us. Yeah, it, it got me that I went about three nights ago, and, and there were a lot of stingrays out, and it kind of limited on the, the amount of time I was out. 
and I didn't follow my own advice. I was just walking, not paying attention, and I stepped on a couple, and it did scare me. You know, there was a couple of guys around, and I said a few choice words, and they kind of started laughing a little bit. So, you know, you know, that's one thing that you got to keep in mind. And also, too, uh, you know, and I, I don't hide things. I don't try to, you know, tell people that it's it's easy easy going. But if you're out there and you're pulling a fish behind you on a stringer, you want to keep it four or five feet back behind you. There are sharks out there, and sharks can come up and and try to take your your flounder from you. So that's just we're in their environment. So that's one of the things you need to pay attention to. Right, all good questions. Uh, you know, it really is, and I, I'm glad that you're bringing up some. Even though they're not always pleasant, they're they're still. Yeah, um, you need to know it, right? You gotta you gotta have that information. So, so now you you know we're stalking. We 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 understand the equipment aspect of it a little bit, um, and. One of the things, we, so we, we see the fish, and, and one of the things that we do, tell us how we approach the fish to maximize uh, being able to gig successfully. Well, when you see them, you, you want to try, try to keep your light on. That's just so in case he swims away, you can watch him. Um, and and I'll, I'll, I'll hit on this real quick. If he does take off, they leave what, what I call a smoke trail. You'll see them as their tail flops, they'll, they'll leave a little sandy trail, and it looks like a smoke trail. A lot of times, some of the bigger fish sometimes will go on out into deeper water. Other times, they'll move four or five feet and then sit right back down. Or they'll duck into some grass, and you can find them sitting in that grass. So if you keep an eye on them, you'll, you'll be able to find out where they go a lot of times and track them down. But for the ones that don't take off on you, you want to kind of just walk up to them nice and easy. You want to keep your keep your gig head in the water so as you know you don't splash going into the water. As soon as you splash or make any type of, of movement, real sudden, quick movements, the fish will see you and he'll get scared and he'll take off. So you want to have that gig head in the water. You want to ease it over to him. You don't want to wait, you know, five, ten seconds. You want to get it over top of him and, and go straight down and gig him with the gig. And you want to try to get him right in the gill plate. Um, and that's right behind the eyes. You want to get him in the head or in the eyes. If you get a body shot, that's fine. But as soon as you feel it that you gig him, you want to push it as, as hard as you can so that way it goes on through him and it's less of a chance of him getting off. Okay. Good advice there as well. Now, we knew, do need to be careful depending on where we are. Most of us are in the Carolinas. Um, there are various and actually ever-changing uh, regulations on uh, flounder sizes and uh, and limits and things like this, uh, right. don't want you don't want you to go to that right now because that could change tomorrow. But you know, how do we? I think you pretty much gave some good advice there about how to gig it. How do we maybe uh, a guideline on how we look at that fish and try to measure that fish before we gig it and possibly injure or kill a uh, undersized fish? Well, there's, you know, that's always been, been the topic of gigging. Um, a lot of people, you know, that's that's one of the, the advantages that um, hook and line have over giggers. You know, if you start gigging a lot, you'll start seeing those fish, and you'll be able to look at it and judge it and say, ah, he's not a keeper. Let him, let him go. Let him get bigger. You know, and, and with our size limit here, you know, if, he, if he's right around that size, we tend to kind of, you know, as just as a group as a whole, um, we tend to kind of let them go just, just in, you know, to get one a little bit bigger to let that one have a little bit of time. Flounder don't spawn until they're about 16 or 17 inches. So it takes them two or three years to get to that size. So we try to let them have that 16-inch phase where they can at least spawn a couple of times. But on my, on my gigs, and I know some of the other ones, you can make marks. Um, with our limit here, I've got it from the tip of my gig down to the bottom of a sticker that I've got on my gig. You can walk up to them and measure them. You can set it down in the water, and you want to put it down beside of him as long as you don't touch him. Most of the time, not 100% of the time, most of the time they won't swim away. If you don't touch them, they'll sit there. So you kind of get an idea of, of the size. Um, because if you're looking at the fish and you say, man, he's a big one, the water tends to distort his size, it makes him bigger. So if you gig a fish and you pull him up, and he's liable to be a lot smaller. So yeah, that's that's one of the things you need to get your eyes adjusted to. And there's some some people that are really good that can look the distance between their eyes and know what size they are. I'm not that good. Um, I, I I have to actually look at them. And I look for those ones that are the doormats. You know, they go, oh my gosh, look how big he is. And then those are the ones I get or try to anyway. 
Um, but you, you, know, you want to check those. If you've got one that's kind of iffy, I tell some people, you know, with my gigs, if you've got the single prong gig, a three prong gig, or a four or five or whatever, if you take and you try to get that fish in the picture that's on here right now, if you go back to, the, to where um, the bottom part of this picture, down towards that little middle part, just right below the center of his back, his back and spine goes right down the middle of him to his tail. If you go right down to the back part of it and hit him either there or on the top part, right right where it starts turning to go back to his tail, and you don't hit him in the back, that's just all meat. A lot of times if you gig one or two of the gigs in there and you get him up and he's not a size, he has a little bit better of a chance of surviving that than if you were to gig him right in the gill plate. So, you know, if you've got one that's, you know, maybe yeah, he's, he's might be a keeper, you gig him like that and you pull him up and you go, oh, man, he's, he's a half inch too, too short. I, I, I got to let him go. He, most of the time when you take him off that gig, he'll swim away. So that, that just gives him a little bit better of a chance. Okay, very good. Let's stop for a minute. Do we have any questions out there so far? If you'd like to put it on the chat, or if you uh, if you're able to communicate uh, with us uh, by audio, tell us if you've got a question for Clint. Sit here and look and see if somebody comes in either verbally or by a chat. I think they're just taking it in, Clint. Um, so yeah, go ahead. You know, keep keep put, bringing them in if you have one. We're going to go ahead and proceed and, and let Clint keep on. Uh, so so now you know we we've pretty much talked about. It. Now let's talk about the conditions and the better times, worst times, things that we you know if we really want to get down to it and figure a really really good time to go out and to. Uh, uh, to flounder gig, what would what would be the time of year, the water temperature, those kind of factors? Uh, well, it's it's pretty much if you're in a boat, it's year round. Um, you know, we we've got giggers here locally that that gig year round, and, and even in the cold time, you know, when it's 30 degrees outside, they're on the water uh, and they're out gigging and they're successfully gigging. They just have to go to a little bit deeper of water, uh, you know, 10 or 15 feet to to get the fish. But um, primarily, you know, for for the the summertime activities, you know, the fish start coming back in uh, middle middle to late part of April. Um, normally, what they say, you know, and it's just like every other thing around here, all the other fish. When you start seeing the other butterflies, the fish are back, and, and it's true. I mean, you know, I've I've seen it. You start seeing some yellow butterflies, you go out, and the fish are starting to come around. So, usually, the middle to the end part of April. And it goes all the way up until about the first week or two of December, and that's for walk gigging. Um, you know, the, the water starts getting really cold, and it, the the fish start feeding and start going in a little bit deeper of water. Um, but you know, this this stuff of them saying that, you know, in January and February there's no fish around. There's no fish around because nobody's out looking for them and actually seeing that the fish are still there. <laughs> yeah, the fish so, are there. People aren't. Yeah, and and. Where I go, um, I look for the tides. Uh, I look for low tide, two hours before low tide, two hours after low tide, and that's just because of where I go. It's up next to seawalls and grass and docks. If I was to go out there at high tide, then I would be swimming, looking for them, and it would be a different form of fishing. I'd be spear fishing and snorkeling, and um, I'm not into that yet. But that, that's one of the things that I look for. I look for that tide. Um, I've had some people tell me that, you know, full moons, uh, the fish are really scarce. They see you. They see your shadow. Uh, my argument to that is they don't see my shadows because my light is, is reflecting in the water, and it's pretty much canceling me out. So when I'm lighting the water up underneath in the water, they don't see what's up above them. They're, they're, they're looking around. Uh, that light is shining on them. So, excuse me. So it's. You know, some people like the new moon phase, some like the old moon phase. I've been out pretty much any time I hadn't really paid attention to the moon phases, and I've seen fish. It might not have been the size of fish I was looking for, but I've seen a lot of fish, and we've, we're still seeing a lot of fish. So pretty much between April and the, the first week of December are really good times. The, um, the September, October, November time. The, you start really getting some fat fish, you know, the, the bigger ones, the fatter ones that have been eating a lot, and they tend to kind of sit around a little bit. So they're they're trying to fatten themselves up so when they go out to spawn, they're, they're 
good to go for a while. I think you answered, well, we had Ken ask the question, what about tides? Are lower tides better or full moon tides? I think you pretty much covered that. Am I correct yeah. with that? Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. Some of the things with the high tides you, you want to be careful about, you know, if, if you're out you know, either in a boat or walking, you, you start getting those really, really high tides, and that pushes a lot of water in, and that pushes a lot of water in to the grassy areas and, and marshes and stuff where it's hard to actually get in and see. And those fish will get in that, that grassy area because that's where all the bait fish go into. Um, they'll, they'll tend to kind of stay out, um, you know, out, out of those areas. Um, I try to stay out of those areas when it's high, high tide like that because you can't get in there really good. Now, if you're in a boat and you can get through there, it's hard to see them, but that, that's where they're at. They're in that grass and all. So, you know, I, I tend to like lower tides just because of where I go. Um, but you can pretty much catch them in any, any of the tides. What kind of bottom are we looking for when we, uh, what, or, you know, we, we pretty much know I, know, I know I'm very familiar with the waterway and the marshes, and I know what the bottom's like in most of them. So as I go through there during the day, what are we looking for at night uh, for the bottom? I know where a lot of sandy bottoms are. I know where some oyster rakes are. Tell, tell me where, where I want to go to look for these fish. Um, well, you know, if you're, you're in a boat, you pretty much want to check. All, all those areas. It, it doesn't matter if it's it's sandy bottom or mushy bottom or mar uh, mucky or rocky or, or oysters. Anywhere you see those bait fish congregating, that's where the flounder are going to be. Um, I've seen them, you know, sitting around the um, the oyster beds before at high tide, just sitting waiting and then waiting for that tide to run out. And those bait fish that are being protected by the oysters, they start coming out, and that's when they start feasting. And the same way when the tide's coming back, when the fish, those bait fish are trying to get into the oysters, they're turned the other way, feeding the other way. So, you know, those, those are some of the areas. If you're walking, ideally you want sandy bottom. You don't, you don't want to step in any muck. Um, you want to go out and do your homework and know where you're going to be at, what the bottom looks like. Um, I, I made the mistake, and, and, and I did it when I had somebody with me, thank goodness. Um, I decided to try a different route. And I went past a dock that, for some reason, I had always stopped at before. When I went past this dock, I wasn't four feet past it, and I went waist deep in mud. And I had weight, uh, chest waders on. So the tide was low, it was starting to come back in, and that tide wants to come in really fast on you. So it, it could have gotten dangerous. But uh, that's the type of stuff that you want to be careful about. You don't want to step into a muddy hole and get sunk in over your head, and it's I, possible. I I'll jump in on that because I wasn't wasn't flounder gigging, but I was out uh, crabbing one day years and years ago, and I had my son with me, and uh, we were actually near the ferry terminal down at uh, Fort Fisher, uh, and and outside of Wilmington, and I did exactly the same thing. And if you don't think you can stick up to your waist, we certainly did. We were up to our hips in mud, both of us at the same time, and uh, tide coming in, and it was pretty scary, but we were able to. Uh, it took several minutes to get out, and it's a very scary situation. It can, and like you say, it can go from scary to really bad really quickly. So um, you definitely want to be careful of that and know know what your bottom is. So yeah, 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 you do, and and that's the thing. And then you know, as like I said, you know, a lot of people will tell you right off the bat that the, the fish won't get into rocks. They won't be in rocks. They won't be around them. The flounder. Um, I, I just had an experience the other night. I was out walking. The the area that I was walking in was about knee deep of water. That's usually where I find most of my fish when I'm walking. And I'll, I'll primarily talk about walking because that's what I do. But I was in knee deep lesser water, and that area that I was looking in was really mucky. It was just really just turned up. The the, the water was. It had a lot of sediment in it. So I, I walked and walked. I found a bunch of small ones. I got to the end of where I was getting ready to get out of the water, and there was a lot of center blocks and rocks. And, and this is no, no lie, right there, sitting on top of a center block, out of the, out of the churned up water was a 19-inch flounder, just sitting on top of it. He was on the center block, and, and I've never seen it before. He was, he was on top of it. It was like he was trying to get up out of the dirt so he could see, and he was just sitting there. I, I, didn't, I thought he was dead. I went up, and I geeked it anyway, and sure enough, he was alive. He came off, and I pinned him to the ground, and put him in. Carried him on home. I'll be doing. So, I mean, that's that's one of the things you got to you know, look in some of those areas. You know, you don't want to sit there and say, "Well, they're never up in the rocks when they are." You know, at times. Yeah, you don't want to disqualify anything out there, really, do you? you right. Know? Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. 
Uh, what what about um, you know clear, uh, water clarity have any bearing on it? Does that uh, does that play a factor? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it, if it's if it's the bottom's turned up, if it's murky, um, it, it doesn't affect the fish. It affects you being able to see through it. Um, you know, I, I was fighting the, the tides. I, I normally I walk into the tide so that way anything that I kick up gets blown behind me. Um, I, I, I try not to uh, walk with the tide because then all that muck and dirt that you kick up comes with you. And if you stop and see one, he'll get covered up, and then he can get gone really quick. So that's, that's one of the things that you want to, to concentrate on is walk into the tide. Um, if it is a little murky, you want to slow your pace down a little bit, and you want to look a little bit harder because you know they, they can be covered up just a little bit, and then all you see is two white bubbles floating in the water on the bottom, and that could be a flounder. Uh, that's what their eyes look like. Okay. Now, Mike has had um, uh, he had a question about your your light setup, and this is your opportunity because you you manufacture <laughs> those. So I'm going to let you handle that one and uh, uh, and and tell us tell us what you do have because I'm pretty intrigued with it. You know that, so tell tell the rest <laughs> of them. I appreciate it. Well, my my light's a 1600 lumen LED light. Um, it's like pretty much any other Cree LED lights. They're guaranteed for 50,000 hours of operation. Uh, LEDs, you just can't beat them. I mean, it's just a teeny tiny diode in there, and it puts off so much light. Um, there's some other, other lights that are out there that, that run off a 12-volt battery that you have to carry in a fanny pack. Uh, there's other ones that run off of car batteries, um, and, and those are good. You, you don't, now you don't have to worry about floating a cooler or a wash drum behind you and carrying a car battery and using a, a car headlight wrapped in foam floating it on the water or carrying a lantern. Um, there's some manufacturers out there now that make them that run off of double A batteries. Uh, you have to have usually six to eight double A batteries to get you four or five hours of run time. Uh, my batteries are what they call an 18650 battery, which is what they use in the e-cigarettes. Um, laptop batteries, the portable power packs that you carry for your phones and laptops and all, that's got an 18650 battery in them. So you can pretty much get them um, at, at the battery stores or at those cigarette stores, the e-cigarette places, or you can get them online. Um, it's a little bit bigger than a AA. Uh, mine are lithium-ion rechargeable batteries. So you get the two batteries, and they run my light right around two to two and a half hours. That, that's what I tell everybody. I've had several people contact me back and express that it didn't run their light two and a half hours. It ran it three to four hours. So that, that's, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But I tell everybody two to two and a half hours. And then you get two of them, so you're out there walking for five hours. That's a lot of walking. And especially walking into the tide, you, you're done at five hours. So that, that's what my lights run off of. And it's, it's a PVC pipe. Uh, it's watertight. I've got a, uh, a new uh, battery compartment that I developed over the, uh, over the winter time. And uh, it's a pretty cut and dry, push button on, push button off. Um, you put the battery in, one battery runs it at a time. And I sell the light, and then I got a combo kit that's got the gig, uh, the batteries, the, the uh, charger, and then what we talked about, the stringer, which is basically just a bigger stringer than what you used to use for the brim and crappy and stuff in fresh water. So that way you can just hook them in the mouth and keep right on traveling. Very good. Now, Ken came back when you, because he had the question about the tides, and, and he, he had a comment. He said, it's hard to walk in those big tides, so that was, uh, uh, that I'm going to imagine. <laughs> I have to agree with him on that. So. Yeah, yeah, it uh, is. It is It is hard to walk in. I mean, you, you, you start getting up in some of those areas, and that's why I like the lower tides. I mean, you, you get those big tides, and like I told you, you're, if you're walking, you're swimming. Um, so, you know, that's, that's why I try to stay out, out of the big tides, unless – you know of the areas that you're going to go, like here at Topsail Beach, if you go down to the point, it doesn't matter if it's high tide or low tide. You know, you've got enough beach area that you can walk in that tide line at high tide or low tide. But if you're trying to get back up into the grass or under the docks, you're, you're going to be swimming. You're going to have to dive under the docks to get through them. So that's why I, I tend to go at low tide. Um, but if you've got an area that you've got a lot of beach or you've got sandy or shelly bottom or whatever, you can go at high tide. Um, you just have to go out, and that's, that's what, like, deer hunting. You have to go out during the day to look and see where you want to go, where the signs are. And you'll see the signs at low tide and high tide 
even during the day. You, I've walked around on the in the waterway before at during the daylight and saw a flounder print. As the tide went out, there's a fresh flounder print sitting there. So that's that's telling you there's flounder in that area, and that flounder may come back that night because he had good success. So they'll keep coming back to that same area. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, you know we're getting ready to wrap it up. If you've got any more questions, please let us uh, let us hear it or put it on the chat. And um, I know some of you are hearing it because we can hear some background noise there. So uh, let us uh, let us hear your questions because you got the expert here. Let's take advantage of it. Uh, I'm going to take I don't advantage know if I'm of an expert. <laughs> uh, well, I, I think you are uh, from what I've seen and heard. So and, and I'm going to take you up on going out there one day. So I, I can't wait. And, uh, and we're going to. Uh, Make sure we we learn how, and that way we'll be uh, be able to go back out when we can. So, oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any any questions out there, guys? Okay. All right. I keep uh, keep giving you there's there's uh, call for questions. I, I think it's a great concept. I, I've actually seen Clint's product, and and like I say, is it, it really is a neat product, and I've taken it to a lot of uh, fishing events and showed it off. Um, for Coastal Carolina Fisherman, uh, which he's one of our advertisers. And, and what's really neat about it is you get a lot of questions about it, and you get a lot of these old guys that have, have uh, Clint mentioned using the lanterns, that are still using lanterns, and they look at that thing and they think it's the greatest thing they've ever seen. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty neat product, and um, you can uh, – these guys were from Moorhead, Clint. Do you have the product up there anywhere uh, in the um, back shops? No, I, the, the, I'm up in Jacksonville right now, but I've just been. I was contacted a couple of days ago from a um, a company in Moorhead. Um, as soon as I get with them this week and show them my product and all, and uh, hopefully we'll get some in there. I am. I was in a store up in Newburn, uh, Coastal Marine Fabrication. They're supposed to let me know if they want to have some more of them brought into their store, but they've expressed an interest in it as well too. But you've got a website also, so. <laughs> And yes, yeah, I got a, I got a website and it's on the uh, the bottom right corner there, uh, and my logo right at the top. Also, too, my phone number's there. Um, you know, if you have any questions or you know you want to talk about it, you know, feel free to give me a call. But uh, I do ship. Um, the you know we we'll try to try to work out you know some decent deals on shipping and off because it can get a little expensive when you start getting. The, and, getting and I would imagine too well. that if, if somebody has a question, they can give you a call about a flounder gigging question as well. Yes, so yes, they can call me or send me an email. Yeah. Yep, yep, you're, yep, you're, you're give me an email that. address as well, too, yep. Okay, guys, well, thank you so much again for joining us tonight, and thanks for being CETO members. We really appreciate that, and I hope you'll make contact with Clint. This is a great setup, and he's a wealth of knowledge about flounder gigging. I know I'm going to be calling him an awful lot in the future. So, uh, But, again, thanks for coming out with us tonight. We hope you enjoyed it, and uh, be safe out there.